Greetings, everyone. Greetings. Good to see you here. Thank you for coming out. Uh, I'd like to begin with uh, very warm thanks uh, to Brian. Brian, where are you? There he is back there. Brian has done a lot to make this happen. Uh, also, uh, thanks to Anna for that generous introduction. And I'd say we should also give a round of applause to the staff of this museum, which keeps America's maritime heritage alive. Now, I'm very happy to have a chance to talk with you this evening about a part of that maritime heritage which is not always included in American's history of the seas. I want to talk to you about this book that I've written, The Amistad Rebellion. And I want to begin just by reminding everybody what happened in that story, okay? Just let me summarize what happened. The year is 1839, and this slave schooner, La Amistad, which in Spanish means friendship, kind of a cruel name for a slave ship, I think, contains 53 enslaved Africans, 49 of them men and four of them children, including three little girls. They are being carried from Havana to another part of Cuba where the sugar plantation system is just exploding. Sugar is a key to Cuba as one of the most dynamic slave societies in the world. So they're on their way on a coastal voyage of only about 300 miles. During that voyage, a revolt at sea takes place. The Amistad Africans rise up. They kill a member of the crew of the Amistad and then they kill the captain, a man named Ramon Ferrer. They take control of the ship with the idea of sailing back to their African homeland, which is Sierra Leone. They all come from southern Sierra Leone. They keep two of the uh, Cubans alive. These were actually their so-called owners. Jose Ruiz and Pedro Montes. It turns out Montes had been a ship captain, so he knew navigation. And they told him, sail toward the rising sun, because the rising sun had been at their backs when they made the middle passage across the Atlantic in the first place. Well, Montes was a very clever man. During the day, he did sail to the east as he was instructed, but he kept the sails loose and flapping in the wind so as not to make too much progress. And then at night, he reversed course and headed back towards the Caribbean and the North American coast in the hope that he would be discovered, that they would be captured, and that he and his fellow Cuban slave owner would be saved. So he tricked the Amistad Africans. Eventually, they saw that lacking food and water, they were not going to be able to make a long voyage. And so it was asked by Montez, do you want me to take you to a free country? And they said, what free country is this? That free country is the United States. Well, you're talking about one of the leading slave societies in the world in 1839. Not exactly a free country. But to make a long story short, the Africans actually sailed the vessel all the way up to the northern end of Long Island, where they were taken by a U.S. Navy ship, carried to New London, Connecticut, and thrown in jail, charged with murder and piracy. Now, as soon as word got out that these Africans had come ashore, abolitionists from up and down the eastern coast flocked to the jail to try to assist them, thinking that this cause might help them to advance their struggle against the institution of slavery. Well, a long legal battle took place. For 19 months, the Amistad Africans were in jail, 
They did receive support from no less a person than John Quincy Adams, a former president, at that time congressman, who represented the 36 survivors before the United States Supreme Court and won a dramatic victory, declaring them illegally enslaved and therefore free and enabling them to return to their native land, which they did eight months later. In November 1841, they returned to southern Sierra Leone, taking with them a group of missionaries, and this then is the origin of the American Missionary Association, who would then create something called the Mende Mission. Here we have an image of the ship itself, the Amistad, and the moment that it depicts is the meeting with a group of white hunters on that northern end of Long Island. You can actually see them here. Yes? This is the Amistad, and in the background, this is the naval vessel, the U.S. Brig Washington, that is on the way to capture them. This was probably produced by an abolitionist artist sometime after the actual voyage. So what we have here is a very important case in the struggle against slavery, important because it was a victory. This kind of thing was not common. The institution of slavery was extremely strong. Abolitionists and enslaved Africans won a very significant victory in this case. Okay, so this subject has been much studied, and it's been well studied. So you may be wondering, why write a new book about it? Well, my interest in this particular case grew out of the previous book that I wrote, entitled The Slave Ship, A Human History. This was published in 2007. This was a pretty gruesome subject to study, I want to tell you very painful to see what was done to so many millions of Africans in the pursuit of profits. The terror that was crucial to the management of people on board these vessels. I really had to live with this for several years while writing this book. And as I studied the slave ship, what I found was that there were a great many rebellions that rose up under the most extreme circumstances, it was really quite uh, inspiring to see that the enslaved people kept fighting back no matter what, even when they had almost no chance of success. Many rebellions, very few successful rebellions. So in the back of my mind is the Amistad case. Why was this one successful? I really wanted to know. This was a, an extraordinary counterpoint to a gruesome history. And it, it captured my imagination. So I began to read all of the work about the Amistad. One of hundreds of slave revolts on board ships, but one of the very few that actually achieved victory. And what I found bothered me in this sense, there was very good scholarship on the case, but it was almost all about the legal struggle. Very few people had actually studied the revolt. Very few people had actually wondered why it was successful in the first place. So it seemed to me that something important had been lost. It also seemed to me that in the process the real heroes of the case, by that I mean the Africans who risked their lives to gain freedom, had been pushed aside. And that politicians and judges and abolitionists had become the main players in the story. John Quincy Adams, featured here, is, I think, a kind of iconic hero of the Amistad case. And I must tell you, he played an extremely important role. But nothing happened 
without the actions of this man and those other 52 Africans on board that vessel. 